What in the world is happening? More and more these days, it just kind of feels like the uh, earth is spinning out of its orbit, doesn't it? I mean, we, we've got stuff we're watching on TV that in the news slot that's just like staggering. ISIS slaughtering Christians and billboards like this one denigrating the meaning of Christmas. The little girl saying, Dear Sam, all I want for Christmas is to skip church. I'm too old for fairy tales. And that's just one of many right now that are out around the Christmas. Today, I want to tackle where this is coming from. Where the hatred, where the, the, uh, the, the, the angst toward God and Christianity is coming from right now. And we're going to look at an Old Testament prophecy that was written by David. The, the shepherd boy, the giant killer Goliath, the... the the Israel's greatest king. I mean, he went on to become Israel's greatest king. What makes this fascinating is how Psalm 2 describes an escalating conflict that is playing out 3,000 years later right in front of our eyes. God put this in the Bible so we could understand what's happened, so we could know what he wants us to do about this. Now, it's interesting that David was the greatest warrior to ever live. I mean, with combat victories that blow away any king before him or after, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's actually prophesying here. He, David was a prophet as well as a king. Uh, and uh, he's prophesying about a war that's going to take place at the end of the age before the return of Jesus. And it is the war to end all wars. So he tells us how it begins. He says, the nations will rage against God, and it'll grow into this global military conflict uh, that's, that's uh, going to be witnessed by all. And we can see the beginnings of it being waged right now in the various public arenas of our world. Here are just three examples from right here in America right now, this year. Uh, these are unbelievable. City officials actually prohibited senior citizens from praying over their meals, listening to religious messages, or singing gospel songs at a senior center, center in Texas. U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs banned the mention of God from veterans' funerals overriding the wishes of their families. That one took a full-out um, lawsuit to get the policy changed. And two people were arrested for giving away Bibles on public sidewalks under the direction of a constitutional lawyer, the Liberty Institute that researches hostility toward religion in America, found that in 2013, th this past year, uh, there were almost twice the number of incidents than the several previous years combined. And it, it's an alarming increase. I mean, there's, the, the publication fills more than 350 pages of these kind of things. There is an unholy alliance of secularists right now who are building momentum to remove any influence of God and Jesus and the Bible from our culture. And I think if you, you know, just stay aware of the news, you're, you're seeing that. And what seems to bother these people the most is the idea that Jesus has the right to determine what's moral and what's not. And especially that he can hold every individual accountable to what he says because he's God. There's just a growing outrage right now. And it's only going to increase. It's directed against God, his morals, his ways, and his people. The reason that I want us to recognize this is because the battle lines are being drawn up. I mean, there, there's no question about this. It's, I mean, it's a, and very soon, every one of us in this room will have to decide whether we will stand for or against the truth of Scripture. This is not going away. And the best time to decide whether you're going to stand for God and his version of the truth or a watered-down compromise version is right now before the onslaught begins. This is the time for us to wholeheartedly embrace the truth, to begin to build an authentic relationship with Jesus, because if it is hard to take a stand now, it is going to be way harder to take a stand 10 years from now. And it's going to be way, way, way harder 20 years from now. I mean, with the proliferation of entertainment and technology that we've got going right now, the way it has mesmerized us, the way it is captivating us, and the way it is increasing, I mean, that's pretty easy to see. 
And God warned the nation of Israel about a coming battle through the prophet Jeremiah. In chapter 12, verse 5, he said, if you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with the horses? He said, if, the, if you can't run with the footmen, you're not going to be able to run when things really get hot. So he's saying, this is not the time to hide. This is not the time to curl up in a fetal position. This is the hour to root our lives in God, to get clear on his word, to strengthen our resolve, to stand, to not wait to, for things to get easier, to get our hearts and our minds in shape, to be able to run with what God's saying and what God's doing, because God is about to move in the midst of all this chaos, and we want to be with him. We want to be, be God's not going to stand back on the defensive. There's going to be a move of the Holy Spirit in the midst of this, and we want to be running with it. We want to be on target with the Holy Spirit. All right, I know that what I'm saying here sounds a little intimidating, and it's why a lot of believers right now are reacting by twisting and distorting the Bible to accommodate what's popular so they can avoid the conflict altogether. They want to feel good about their faith. They don't want to take sides. They say, I love Jesus, you know, but I, I want to be a secret, silent disciple. You know, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm not weighing in on all this stuff. I don't want to get involved in all of this. But there's another group of people, another group of believers who want to be compassionate, who want to really care about people, but they also want to be faithful witnesses to Jesus and his word. And I want us to be that people. I want us to be right in that group, loving and reaching out to people without compromise, without giving in. And that's why we spent so much time studying the Sermon on the Mount. Because we want to understand what it means to seek God's kingdom first. We want to know what it means to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's a huge part of what that message is, what Jesus' sermon is. Jesus is saying, this is how you love God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And understanding Psalm 2 is, is going to add to this. It's going to help us. Now, the famous preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, Psalm 2 is like a four-act play. Because if, if you read my Facebook post and you've been reading it, you probably are wondering, huh? What is going on here? It's like four different things. And uh, he called it the great drama unfolding on the stage of history. So let's, let's look at this. All right, in Act 1, the kings and the people of the earth conspire to defy the authority of God. In Act 2, God responds to that. The third act, Jesus answers it. And the last act, David tells the kings who's going to win, and it's not them. All right? So let's dig into this. Verse 1. If you have your Bible open, you can read it right out of your Bible, or we'll read it. You can follow along off the, the screens. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Now it's God the Father's turn. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. And then Jesus says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And this is David. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. All right, one more time. So here are the four parts. The kings and the people openly defy God. They war against the influence of his word in the culture. Number two, the father responds. He openly exalts Jesus as his king of all the earth. Number three, Jesus answers. He prays in agreement with the father's decree. <laughs> this is so fascinating. And four, David warns the leaders of the culture and the government that they are called to serve the Lord. Now, again, I believe this is one of the most relevant passages in the Bible for understanding what's happening in our world right now. 
So let's dig into verse 1, all right? Why do the nations rage? And again, I think the real focal point uh, is they're standing against God's definition of morality. That's what's going on here. And right now we're seeing that big time with the gay agenda. Suddenly it's being accepted in the military, changes are being made to accommodate it in our schools. Seems like every TV show you watch has a gay character or 12 in it. You know, it's, it's like, whoa. And, and when the first football, gay football player came out earlier this year, you know, so many of the top leaders of the NFL are going, oh, this is the most wonderful thing. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm a little shell-shocked by this whole business. You know, like, what? I want you to know I have real compassion for people who struggle with sin as a fellow struggler, all right? I do esteem the value and the dignity and the rights of every single human being, but to celebrate immorality as a virtue? When did we get there? When did this happen? How did we come to this? But here's what's behind it. See, here's what's going on. The the gay agenda is just what's pushing the dialogue right now on who gets to define what's moral and what's not. It's the tip of the spear. It's moving uh, the nations forward to reject God's idea of morality. And, and guys, this is international. I mean, I, I've talked to some people who know leaders in Africa who are getting pressured to, to, to go this direction. I mean, it is an international, it's the, the, the pressure's on. Now, just so you know, the Lord is equally against all immorality heterosexual sexual, and homosexual. Let me just say this again. His definition of immorality is any sexual involvement with another person outside of the covenant of a marriage between a, one man and one woman. I mean, that's God's definition. And to me, listen, it is weird how something that is so blindingly clear in Scripture and so commonly accepted in Western society has become countercultural with this kind of breakneck speed. I mean, w- that we're seeing now. I mean, it's just like, bam. Well, <laughs> here in verse one, the nations are raging. They're beyond mad. They're consumed with violent hatred. They're in an uproar. There's no neutrality or tolerance whatsoever. In our culture, the word tolerance has already been redefined to mean the acceptance of anything that is free of the Word of God. You know, there's no neutrality or tolerance where the Word of God is concerned. Have you noticed that? These nations here in Psalm 2 are definitely not saying, well, you know, we respect all opinions. You know, we agree to disagree with you guys, you know, you Christians. You go your way, we'll go our way. No. There's no semblance of respect here. This is full-blown, unleashed rage. And I'd say the anger is smoldering right now, but it's going to erupt full force and be witnessed across the earth. We're going to see this more and more. The time of passive indifference toward the church, you know, like, you know, we really don't agree with you guys, but hey, you know, live and let live. I mean, let the church do whatever they want. Those days are quickly coming to an end, and we're seeing it. We're seeing it right now. Maybe you're thinking, well, did you get up and failed to drink coffee this morning? That is so negative, Ron. Why don't you lighten up? No, we need to understand what the Bible says about the negative stuff that's coming. I mean, the Bible is real clear that some dark days, the big trouble is coming, that the big dark cloud is coming. So, and, and, and I'll tell you why we have to. So we're not offended at God when it happens. Jesus warned us about this. We don't want to be surprised or worse, deceived by what comes along. Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, 10. He said, it's why so many Christians are going to chuck their faith in the days ahead and accept a compromised version of the gospel. You don't want to do that. Verse 1 also says, the people plot a vain thing. Now, reading that makes me think of, you know, some of the interesting things that have happened over the last, you know, few years. The like uh, the positive things, the Arab Spring that happened back in 2011 when students gathered in dorm rooms and cafeterias and out on the streets and, 
you know, use social media to plot thousands of little strategies to protest abusive authoritarian governments. And that was positive. I mean, that's what happened in Egypt that overthrew Mubarak's uh, regime and, you know, and, and brought, you know, good. But now we see how ISIS is using the same media in a negative way. Social media can engage, enrage, and enable millions of people living continents apart to plot good and evil. And right now it's helping to create this unholy momentum toward God and his word that's giving people courage to believe that what they're doing is going to work. That, you know, hey, what, we're, what we believe now is bigger than God's word. And, but David assures us it's all a vain endeavor. The plot to remove God's word from society will ultimately fail. But for a short season... It'll seem to succeed. It'll seem like they're, you know, this is winning. Everybody's coming together. And we can see the unholy momentum gathering speed right now. But it will utterly fail in the end. The word of God, the glory of God, the fame of Jesus will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's God's promise as he fulfills his master plan. God is not indifferent right now. He is not out of the scene. He's in the big picture going, I got this all under control. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this all back in one fell swoop. And I mean in one fell swoop, it's going to come back to him. Verse 2 says, the kings of the earth set themselves. They take their stand and the rulers of the earth take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now the Lord that... David is talking about here. Let's just get this straight, all right? This is the God of Israel, all right? There's only one God, and that's who he is. He is not the generic God that we hear celebrities and athletes thanking for helping them win an Oscar or a touchdown. Not the same God, all right? David's saying they're against the, the, the God of Israel, and his anointed. Now, that means the Hebrew word there is, is Messiah. It's the, it's the Greek word for Christ. You can use the three interchangeably. The leaders of society, they aren't against charitable deeds. They aren't against, they applaud humanitarian efforts like helping the poor and standing against human sex trafficking. But, but it has to be done apart from any mention of the God of Israel and his son Jesus. You, you, you can't do that. And some viewers will even, some Christians will even say, well, yeah, but we don't want to offend anybody using the name of Jesus. You know, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, we're a multicultural society these days. If that's where you're at right now, you've already bought the lie. You have bought this PC, this po politically correct lie. Jesus is the only one who suffered and died on a cross to pay the debt for human sin. He is our only hope. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to God. He said no one can come to God any other way. Listen, guys, no other way. That includes Buddha, that includes Muhammad, that includes Allah, that includes any of the Hindu gods. Those were Jesus' words in four, John 14, 6. No man can come to the Father except by me. Helping hurting people, great things to do. But as born-again believers, we absolutely have to attach it to the only name that can connect them with God, the name of Jesus. And so, you know, we got to pull out of this cautious mode that we're in, where we don't say his name, where we don't talk about the God of Israel, because he's coming back as the God of Israel, and he's going to, the Jews are going to be brought into the family, and they're going to be leading the charge, and so that, you know, that's his special people. So we've got to, you know, we've got to get with God's program and get out of the political, politically correct speech that we've been pushed into. Notice here in verse 2 how the kings of the earth come together and actually agree on their plans. Now, how unusual is that? That almost never happens. Heads of government 
You can't get them to agree on anything. It's like herding cats. You know, they don't, anything they do, it's limited, temporary. You know, they're always maneuvering to get the best deal for themselves in their own country. But David said, on this one thing, they're going to agree. They're going to lay aside everything else and agree on standing against Jesus. Now, not all, obviously, will agree. I mean, there will be government marketplace leaders who, are, who stay faithful to Jesus. And these rulers who take counsel aren't necessarily the kings themselves. I think uh, this is talking about the power brokers, the, the economic, the media, the educational, the military leaders, because it's really the economic kingpins who put the kings in place. The kings mostly do the bidding of the money people because they need their support. So these rulers are plotting together. They're, they're gathering in boardrooms to figure out how to make immorality sound more dignified. Sanction it into legitimacy. They're out to remove God's influence altogether. David said, that's where this is going. That's what's happening right now, big time. And I'm telling you, you don't have to do much channel surfing to see that this is happening. I mean, it's, it's sick, the kind of all-out push that we're in right now to just remove any definition of morality. Verse 3, here's the master plan. Let us break their bonds. Now, you realize who he's talking about, what he's talking about. These are God's bonds. Let us break their bonds, God's bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. God's bonds and cords are a very clear reference here to, to his word because they see it as enslaving people instead of liberating them. They, they see God's word as a chain that restricts and keeps people from realizing their full human potential sexually and intellectually. Now, we know that the opposite. We know that, you know, God's word liberates us to our true potential, that sin is what enslaves us and, 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 and it causes addiction and all these problems, that our destiny can only be fully realized in the grace of God under Jesus' leadership. But notice in verse 3 how, these, how those words break and cast away. They, they reveal this aggressive, even hostile tone. They want to destroy every semblance of God's influence on the culture. There's a kind of determined finality to their revolt. And again, the rumblings have already begun. A federal judge threatened a high school valedictorian with jail time unless she removed references to Jesus in her graduation speech. Happened in Texas. As bizarre as that sounds, back in 2011, it took a lawsuit to protect her right to free speech. And now that gay marriage seems to be inevitable throughout the land, we're going to witness the fallout of that in the days ahead. When we cast off God's standards of right and wrong and throw out his design, who's to say where the line should be drawn? People want freedom to do as they please, no boundaries, no restrictions. If a man can marry another man, why can't he marry his sister? Why can't two men marry a woman? I actually, I, literally, I'm not, I was not trying to find this. I actually turned on a show yesterday where eight people decided to marry each other. I, and they did it in some kind of a weird pagan ritual. It, you know, there's even talk right now of changing the legal status of marriage because some people are saying it's causing so much conflict, why not just outlaw marriage altogether? Just get rid of it. Put us all on the same page. Now, that sounds absurd, doesn't it? The Apostle Paul predicted it. He said, in the last days, they will actually forbid marriage. That's 1 Timothy 4.3. And we thought, you know, I'm telling you, the reason I'm up here doing this today, five years ago, I would have thought, that, ain't, that we, we'll never see that in our lifetime. We probably will. We, we're headed toward it. All right, we got, we got to keep moving act two of this great Psalm 2 drama. It says, the father responds. His message is clear. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. He sits in heaven above it all. So he's not freaking out. <laughs> he's not wiping sweat from his brow. What are we going to do now, Jesus? This is a description of his sovereign power. They're running around below, frantically scheming to overthrow the one who could blow them away with one breath, and he laughs at their folly. 
They've amassed the largest coalition of nations in the history of the planet. The armies, the arsenal of weapons, the aggregate finances, the alliance of global banking and industry resources is massive. There's grassroots support worldwide. Multitudes are united. They're confident now. We're one. We can beat God. (laughs) And God laughs. It it probably was Spurgeon who said it's the most terrifying, terrible laugh echoing through the corridors of history. God goes, you think your little pile of money and guns can somehow overpower your creator and his word? That happened once back in history when some people tried to build a tower. I fixed their wagon. I'll fix yours too. If you all get together and you say immorality is okay, you think somehow that's going to make it so? My word will never be altered. Psalm 138, verse 2, David said, God, you have exalted above all else your name above your word. He's elevated his word above everything. It will never be changed. It will never be moved. Psalm 2, 4 says, the Lord shall hold them in derision. He mocks them for thinking mere human strength can overthrow him. Then in verse 5, he shall speak to them in his wrath. And he's not talking to the average sinner here who's struggling with sin. That's not what this is about. He's warning these kings who have decided to wage war against his word. He's talking to the leaders of society who are fiercely united to oppose his Christ. There's nothing casual. There's nothing unenlightened about this. This is their final decision. And the Lord says to David, I want you to speak to them in my name about my wrath because I'm a God of justice, justice, as well as mercy. Before my wrath is poured out, I'll always give due process, uh, time, you know, witness and warning uh, in case some of them might, you know, yet repent. So to be clear, the gospel of love and grace is his primary message to the nations and sinners of the world. But verse five is a warning to the leaders who are conspiring to drive out the influence of his word. This is aimed at those who are hardened in their rebellion against him. He says, I'm gonna... I'm going to distress them in my deep displeasure. Another translation says, terrifying them with his fierce fury. And then Jesus absorbed it so we'd never have to experience the fury of it. But we do have to receive his sacrifice to escape it. And the Father's ultimate message is here in verse 6 where he says, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Now get this. He's declaring the victory of Jesus as a human king who is going to reign on this physical earth. Remember, he's forever now God-man. He's both. He's all God, all man, forever. Jesus had been God forever in the past. For he would always be God. He's God in the present. But the message is here is that Jesus, the God-man, is being recognized by all the earth as king of all the earth. That's coming. That's what's about to happen. That's where this is all going. God the Father says, I want my son declared as my king because his victory is absolute. Nothing can change that. It is an established fact. He is exalted. I want his supremacy proclaimed throughout the earth. Act 3. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Jesus responds. It's already interesting. (laughs) Jesus responds. Verse 7. Father, I have one thing to say. I will declare whatever you decree. He's saying, whatever you say, I will pray and get my people to agree with me. You say that I'm a king. I'm going to pray for my kingship to be fully manifest on the earth. Now, that is amazing. Get the fact that he's already king, he's crowned at the right hand of the Father, he's already seated on the throne of heaven, but here he's talking about his enthronement on the nations, over the nations of the earth, on the earth. (laughs) That's what the Bible, prophet after prophet after prophet in the Old Testament says they saw the same thing. Him reigning on the mountain in Jerusalem, as king, as the human king over all the earth. He's going to change the whole uh, infrastructure of the, of the earth with us 
in partnership with it. it was, oh, my goodness. Can get into that. We'll get into the millennial kingdom soon. I want to talk to you about that. I just think we need to wrap our heads around where this is going. But this is amazing. Crown king. He's already king. It's interesting that the son doesn't say, well, Father, you said it. I believe it. That settles it. No. Look at how Jesus believes and then he prays. Now, if you ever wondered how this whole thing of prayer works, this is an explanation of Romans 8, 34 that says, it is Christ who died and is also risen, who, even, who is even at the right hand of God, who also does what? Makes intercession for us? You know, he's praying for us? Jesus doesn't just say, well, God, you're sovereign. You said it. I'm sure it'll happen. Father says, no, no. It will happen as you engage in intercession. And I want my people praying in partnership with you. I want, I want you to answer the crisis that's in the nations and my promise to exalt you in the earth with intercession. <laughs> Whoa. I mean, this is remarkable that the Father wants the Son to respond to his decree with intercession. You understand why this has to be a priority to us as well? Jesus, we're going to be praying beyond this life. This is the way God operates. This is the way God created the world. The, the father had this thing in his heart. The son spoke the word, declared the decree. The Holy Spirit went bam, and it happened. That's the way it works. And in eternity, we're going to be doing that with him partnership with him. We're going to be speaking the words. So, so this is more in those 10, 15 second prayers that thank you, Lord, and I love you and asking for help. Intercessory prayer takes time. It's, it's focusing our minds and reigning in our thoughts to, to lock into his promises and agree with what he says he wants to do. It's work. There's effort involved. Isaiah 56, 7, God says, look, my, let's read this together. Read it out loud. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. God said, throughout the earth, my people will be known as my partners in prayer. I think we'll forever be identified as a community of prayer. We'll always be praying. To be, to be the house of prayer means God speaks, and then he moves our hearts as we speak it back to him in prayer, which in turn moves his heart, and then he opens his hand and releases his resources to the earth. <laughs> this is so ingenious. I mean, because that's what keeps the partnership, that's what keeps the relationship going. God speaks, he moves our hearts, saying, I'm going to send revival to your city. So we say, we just say, well, so be it. No, no, we say, yes, Father, yes, send revival to Maryland Heights, send revival to Ferguson, send revival to the whole St. Louis area. You promised you would do it, God. Then God opens his hand and releases resources to the earth, and we call it a move of the Holy Spirit. But it was really in response to us speaking his words back to him. This may, any light bulbs coming on? See, we've just assumed because God said it, it was going to happen. No, it's when we speak it back to him. When we start to say back to God what he said, that when we start to declare the decrees. Now, finally, in Act 4, and I'm just, you notice, I'm just, we're skipping and hopping over this. I, we'll, go back, we'll go back into that at some other point. Finally, Act 4, David responds in Psalm 210 saying, Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Pay attention. Be warned. Prioritize what God's doing. Get this. Serve the Lord with fear. Partner with him knowing that he is God. He's not just really nice and loving. He's the God of angel armies. He's the mighty creator. Serve him. One preacher said, find out what Jesus is doing in your generation, but throw yourself into it with all your heart. Serve what he's doing. Pray. That's where it starts. Then in verse 12, he says, kiss the son lest he be angry. To kiss a king meant to bow down and to pay homage, to honor his authority with affection and wholeheartedness, with our mouth, with our heart, with our lives. We say, I'm yours, Jesus. I'm fully surrendered to you. I want to be f a faithful witness to my generation. I don't want to cave. I want to be a faithful witness. This is not the time to draw back. 
This is not the time to stay quiet. This is not the time to be safe. This is the time to join in what Jesus is doing. This is the time to throw our hearts into it, to pray and love and give and serve and say, you know, we're going for it, Lord. We are going for it. We are not going to be intimidated. We're not going to, you know, uh, 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 be corralled by this politically correct line that's being fed us. We're going to honor Jesus in these days ahead by identifying ourselves with his name and his word even though it becomes increasingly unpopular. And I know this is going to sound like a contradiction, but did you know that it's going to get harder and easier at the same time? <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because I, and I'll tell you with the story. All right, this is it. I'm final. I'm finishing. Peter and John are on their way to pray. So this is after the resurrection Things are hot in Jerusalem. I mean, there's a, still a lot of fear going on. They've watched Jesus crucified, and now they know he's resurrected. And, and so Peter and John are on their way to a prayer meeting, and a beggar, and it, it, they encounter a beggar who asks him for money. And the guy's been crippled from birth. I bet, he's, I, I bet Jesus has passed the guy, you know? Acts 3, 6, Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And in a flash, the guy is healed. Verse 8 says, he went with them into the temple court, walking and jumping and praising God. Well, it attracts quite a crowd. So naturally, Peter starts preaching. 5,000 men were saved on the spot. And believe me, this, the priests were not happy about this. They're right around this whole thing. They threw them in jail. The next day, bring them before their high council for questioning. This is the same group Peter was scared to death of and shaken in his boots a few days before, but now there's a Holy Spirit difference. <laughs> and so, you know, th this is what we're seeing here. I mean, Peter is a new guy. Acts 4, 7 uh, it says it, it all comes down to this. They said, by what power or what name did you do this? This is worth reading, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of all the, uh, of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Listen to this, man. Dude, you're going to get in trouble. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. You just thought that was just a verse in the Bible. This is Peter standing before the crucifiers of Jesus. And even though they had done their best to intimidate these two, look at this, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They, uh, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So they command Peter. They don't stop there. They say, look, you're going to be, you, we're going to get you. We're going to, you know, threaten them some more. Peter, John, run off to the fellow believers. And look at what happens. Verse 24. They get, they get there. The believers immediately, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the seas and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Uh-oh, here we go. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. It's going to get easier to speak the word bolder and, and with boldness because the Holy Spirit is going to do that for us. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because we're asking him to. We've been interceding. We've been asking him for this. We've been crying out to God, and God is going to hear us just like he did them. 
you know, this was just the down payment on that, that whole scenario. This is, this is, we're headed for the big picture when this whole thing is really going to get hot. It's going to be glorious what God is going to do. You know, the, the, there are, people say, well, it, Ron, is it going to get worse? Is it going to get better? Yes. <laughs> it's going to get incredibly better. It's going to get incredibly worse at the same time. I mean, it's going to be harder to face the intensity of ridicule and hatred that's coming at us for doing this, but it's going to, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to rest on the church of Jesus, the praying church, like we have never encountered, like we have never witnessed. It's going to be the greater book of Acts that, that God has promised to this final generation. And I don't know whether we're it. I'm not trying to say, you know, 10 years is max. That's where people get in so much trouble. And I am not going to do that. I mean, it's hard when you look at the evidence and see where things are going to not say, whoa, we're getting close here, guys. This is getting close. But I do believe, you know, that we're, uh, we're in a window uh, of time where things are escalating and we're going to see this thing begin to come together. That's why we're praying the trust prayers and the fellowship prayers. That's why we're coming together tonight at the foundry for prayer. It's why we're creating other times of prayer here. It's why our worship teams are going this direction. It's vertical because we understand where we are and that only by the power of the Holy Spirit are we going to be able to stand up to this and not get duped and not get pulled in. These are the days to give ourselves to the study of God's Word. I was talking to some of the younger guys today about, you know, uh, their feeling, the heat to, to disciple. You know, every one of you ought to be teaching somebody. Did you look at, th look, and think, well, you're the teacher. No, no, you're the teacher. You need to be teaching this to somebody. You, you won't even get this if you're not teaching this to somebody, if you're not giving this away. So you need... We need to be sharing this with each other and teaching this to each other. This new year, I want to challenge you. Get yourself a Bible you can understand, which means not the King James Bible. Get a, get a newer translation. The new International Version is a good one. The New Living Translation is a good one. The bookstore can help you. They got them. Uh, get a Bible reading plan that you can read the whole Bible so that you figure out it's not as incomprehensible as you thought. Message paraphrase, if you're just a beginner, might be a good place to start. Uversion is an app that you can get online. It's free. It works for your pads, for your phones. You can even listen to it in several translations. They've got every imaginable kind of Bible reading plan that'll get you through the whole Bible in a year. Here's why. We want to be able to run with the horses. We want to be able to run with what Jesus is doing when things start to come online. We don't want to be going, I don't know what's going on. We want to say, I know what's going on. <laughs> I, I see it in the Bible. I've seen it in Isaiah. I've seen it in Daniel. I've seen it in Zechariah. I've seen it in Revelation. I know what this is about, and it's going to be glorious. If we'll keep our hearts attached to Jesus and what he's doing, he's, he's running this show. The devil will try to step into it. He's going to try to mess it up. But ultimately, God has his way. We read these statements, you know, in the New Testament, and we think, oh, man, that would have been glorious to live in that, that era. That would have been just so glorious. Those people were getting persecuted. They were getting crucified, some of them. There was a lot of martyrdom that took place in the New Testament. But you know what? When we read it, that's not what we read. We read about the glory of God that was on them. We read about the healings and the power of God. And we read about the grace of the Lord Jesus. Don't you want to be in that? Man, I want to be in that. <laughs>